um, we have to start the, uh, the IAG webinar for Africa. Uh, before that, I would like to, to welcome every, uh, every participant uh, for, for their contribution uh, to this um, webinar. Um, uh, I would like to thank uh, the Executive Committee of the IAG for giving us uh, this opportunity to enjoy the geomorphology in Africa. Um, and uh, also all those who work uh, hardly to give us uh, this, um, this moment. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I think, uh, around uh, 18, 18 contribution. It means that um, we have to be, uh, we have to respect the time. International um, Geomorphology Week, we have one last year. Uh, we had uh, just nine, uh, nine uh, um, contribution, and um, this year I think uh, there were many people uh, uh, who expressed their will to contribute uh, or to present their their work on geomorphology in Africa, and. We hope that we'll have uh, an excellent day, an excellent moment to enjoy the geomorphology in Africa. And also, I uh, would like uh, to thank uh, people from French speaking country uh, like Senegal and Ivory Coast, uh, Congo Brazzaville. Uh, this uh, edition we, is a little bit special because we, um, we will have presentation in French. I did it because it is not easy for those people to present in English. And last year, it, I think it was uh, one obstacle for their presentation, uh, for their participation. So I, I hope that um, uh, any, everybody will understand what uh, they those geomorphologists will present. And also, um, maybe um, during the coming week, we can translate uh, the uh, French uh, abstract, maybe in English, for, for those who want to understand what will be presented. So uh, we have to start because we are out of time. Can I start? Yeah. So I'm looking at the special temporal dynamics of landscape in Ghana. So for the introduction, so spatial temporal dynamics is the relationship between humans and the interaction in space. And this interaction should focus on a healthy and harmonious balance between humans and how they interact with their surrounding environments. Landscape change are mostly generated by the process of aggradation, denudation, and sometimes human activities. And this landscape change has influenced geomorphic hazard for millions of years around the world. Understanding spatial temporal landscape status of an area is a very important feature towards implementing future conservation measures. <coughs> the problem statement. The problem identified in this area was that evidence from satellite imagery proves that the municipality was undergoing massive geomorphic change. That's evidence from the Environmental Protection Agency in 2018. And this has the geomorphic, the, the geologic and, and anthropogenic factors has weakened the base of the mountain, jeopardizing its geological stability and rendering the place vulnerable to geological hazards. 
The problem lies in the fact that despite these numerous changes which is going on on that mountain, a lot of people still prefer to use that place as a residential dwelling, despite the hazards which are associated with them. So this is the map of the study area. And the methodology. So this research used the mass method approach, both the quantitative and the qualitative approach. The quantitative approach used remote sensing and GIS to analyze the extent of change in the area using mainly digital terrain model and digital surface modeling. The qualitative aspect also used of the observation, interviews, and focus group discussions. I sampled 32 people purposively, which include threaded residents and experts in geomorphological activities. And bringing these two methods together gave a better understanding of the problem, hence recommending a better way for the area to be managed. So the findings. So from the GIS manipulations, I was able to discover places which has gone, which has experienced massive changes within the municipality. So where we have the blue circles are the notable places within the municipality which has undergone changes. So the first map on the left is the geomorphic land, land, landscape of the area in 1986. And it was overlaid with another map, which is also in 2006. So we can see the clear difference of the change which has occurred. The study decided to focus on a particular place in the area to conduct the interview. So the area with the red circle was where the interview was focused. That place was chosen because we could see massive changes along that way. And that place is also a popular residential dwelling, despite the massive changes which is going on. In the analysis, it was discovered that all places in the area has either undergone denudation or aggradation. Mostly when we talk about the change in last landscape, our minds are always drawn to, de to, 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 den to denudation other than aggradation. But it was discovered that both denudation and aggradation were going on within the municipality. So in all, we discovered that 56.11% of the landscape area has undergone degradation, whilst 43.89% of the area has undergone the de deposition or aggradation. So on our left, we have the classification of elevation and the changes of the hectares of land, which has undergone changes within the given period of time. Our next objective looked at the causes of landscape change. And the causes of landscape change, which was identified in this area were mainly sand mining, querying, and rapid urbanization. This was proven from the interaction with the residents and experts from the field of ge geomorphology. They confirmed these changes which was going on in other places. And also through the observation, it was also confirmed, which I have peculiar evidence to that. So the first picture on the left corner shows massive building construction, which is going on in the area. And mostly they use the, te the terracing method. They grade the land to have a flat surface then they build. And this enables massive erosion to go on, thereby causing the land to change. 
The picture on the lower part also is an abandoned quarry site. So they quarry stones in the area, and after that, they abandon it and go to another site to continue with the query. This abandoned query site happens at different places within the municipality, and it is massively contributing to the changing nature of the landscape. The next photo is also the effect of this landscape change. So the photo A is a gully which has been created as the result of geomorphologically influenced flood. The flood is mainly influenced by the nature of the slope and the nature of the land within the area. So when it rains, huge volumes of water leave the top of the mountain and rush down below, causing massive gullies within the area, destroying roots and water lines. The picture C also shows a, land, a landslide or a mud flow. When this flood happens, when this flood happens, it carries a lot of sand which weakens the base of the mountain and breaks down the sand to cover the closest route, which is a main road, the highway. So this sand is carried from the top of the mountain, from the top of the mountain, and runs down straight away to the middle of the road. This sometimes causes traffic for over hours, unless disaster the management board comes to clear off the sand before the traffic is eased. The picture D also shows evidence of an earth tremor within the, the area. So on countless times, earth tremors between the magnitude of 1.4 to 1.7 and sometimes 4.7, that was the latest one, has been recorded in this area. But despite all this evidence and all this fact, residents still prefer to live in that area, despite the dangers associated with them. So from the last air tremor, which was recorded in the area, which was in 2019, we had pictures of some of the effects it caused to buildings. So we can see massive cracks in some of the buildings and some of the buildings partially collapsing. But despite all these effects, residents have no intention of moving from that place. So in, in conclusion, it was discovered that anthropogenic activity are undoubtedly the main cause of landscape changes in the municipality. And also the increasing rate at which the landscape is adversely changing is not compatible with sustainable landscaping. That means in the near future, we could see a massive ge geological hazard within the area, which might claim a lot of lives. The fact that despite the geological hazard happening within the area, but no life has been claimed yet, gives the people the confidence that nothing is going to happen within the area. But looking at the rate of change, it's likely a massive hazard could happen within the area. So it was recommended that the government through the municipal assembly should zone the area as a hazard area and relocate the residents to other places to prevent future risk and fatalities. Despite this recommendation being a very tough one, looking at the dicey economic situation of their country, government should take the bold steps if not that, in the future, a lot of life might be lost. Also, it was recommended that government should ensure proper coordination between traditional landowners 
the Environmental Pro Protection Agency, the Assembly, and also those who are in charge of acquisition of land. There should be a coordination between these two people or this group of people so that they will know the right place to sell land to individuals. Most of the people in the area claim that the land has been sold to them. They've bought land with hefty amount of money. So that was the reason why they were not moving from that place no matter what. So if there is a coordination between these people, we will know which land is suitable for building or which land is a hazard prone area and therefore should be zoned to prevent people from dwelling at that place in order to prevent future fatalities. which was given. So that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Full, yeah, full screen mode, please. Can My name is Kamal screen. Darwish. I'm an assistant professor of geography, Department of Geography, Mania University, Egypt. And I'm very happy to give a presentation at the current International Geomorphology Week about the application of remote sensing and GIS for assessing special temporal coastline changes along the Egyptian Mediterranean coast. Uh, my presentation uh, is include location, uh, introduction, location of study areas, materials and methods, GIS-based analysis, results, and the conclusion. For introduction for my, bro my project is, a coastal region is uh, identified as a transition area between the land and the sea. It has more than 2 million of beavers and uh, it's about 45% of the world population around the world. The coastline is uh, the boundary between the land and the sea, and it's one of the most uh, morphodynamic landforms in the airs. The position of shoreline cave is changing due, uh, due to the natural and anthropologic factors and uh, some marine uh, bruises. The advantages of this Dear Kamal, study is... Kamal, please, Kamal, please, can you put it in full screen mode? Excuse me. Full screen. Please. Full screen, doctor. Can you put it in full screen? Full screen. Okay. The importance of my study is special temporal changes of coastal environment is very important to mapping and identifying the special distribution uh, of coastal erosion and its mitigation. Uh, it's essential for coastal engineering construction and conservation. It's very important for urban and land use planning and development projects in coastal areas. There are many benefits of the using of satellite remote sensing and GIS techniques in coastal morphodynamic studies. Uh, for example, the data availability, reputation, and the process, uh, special feature extraction, validation, accuracy assessment, uncertainty of level of confidence. Uh, Using multi-sensor multi and multi-source data, multi-resolution data, and multi-accuracy data, uh, meaning of data diversity. The affordability of data like low price and high quality analysis. Study areas we studied in this, in this project were three different areas along the Mediterranean Sea of Egypt, three different areas. The first of its uh, Nile, uh, North Sinai coastal zone and Nile Delta coast, the third is El Alamein coast. Uh, satellite imagery were collected from uh, uh, the USGS uh, website from in 1990 to 2020 with a five-year interval, including uh, thematic mobile enhanced thematic mobile plus and operational land imaging uh, of surface reflectance level two uh, did. The flow chart of this study, as you see, 
three different stages. The first stage is satellite imagery data collection, pre-processing, coastal extraction, and spectral indices like NDWI and modified NDWI. Um, then accuracy assessment and uncertainty detection. The second stage is building GIS view database and run the digital shoreline analysis system technique and model. The last sheet is our output and the result analysis and model. This is the techniques we're uh, done using the integration of Erdas Imagine and NV software for coastline extraction. Uncertainty and uh, accuracy assessment of shoreline were detected and uh, selected using RMS error and geometric error and some different uncertainty errors, the techniques and the equations as you see in this uh, uh, slides. Analysis and the result by done using digital shoreline uh, uh, analysis technique, which is produced by the USGS. Uh, we used the two special temporal exchange of coastline and statistical computation of uh, 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 net shore movement in the point rate, linear regression rate, using GIS technique. For North Sinai coast, we selected three geomorphic zones the, uh, uh, along the Mediterranean coast to study, especially. The first zone is the Tina Plain Bay and Bardawil Lagoon and the three. The, the third is the Arish Valley Alluvial Fair. The analysis of this uh, North Sinai coast indicated that for the first zone, the Tina Plain Coastal Zone indicated that there are two sectors need to urgent protection, 12.7 kilometer and 4 kilometer with an annual erosion rate of uh, 8.5 and 4.4 respectively. For the second zone, El Bardawil Lagoon Coastal Zone as the zone has a higher erosion of two zones and uh, of two sectors and need to protection with an annually erosion more than eight meter annually. As you see, uh, DSES can use for managing coastal erosion along the coasts and beaches, and it's recommended to use for assessing coastline changes over time. Uh, one uh, another uh, paper used in uh, for uh, North Sinai coastal zone used this technique to assess the impact of El Bardawi Lagoon chitis and artificial inlets. As you see in this slide, the uh, the impact of chitis on the artificial lagoon inlets, inlet one and the two. Uh, the, there are uh, impacts of zen inlets of new coastal erosion zone has been produced along the coast and for El Arish port and the protection zone. This engineering protection zone has been assessed using the, this, the same technique. On the other hand, the same technique has been used uh, along the Nile Delta coast to assess the changes over time along the Nile Delta coast from in 1945 to 2015, the technique, uh, special temporal techniques in this area has been chosen to, uh, to study uh, Nile Delta coast before and after the construction of Aswan High Dam and the reduction of animal uh, sediment rates of this area. And after the construction of the engineering protection works along the Nile Delta coast, like sea walls and other protection works. There are recent publication along the Nile Delta coast and the Mediterranean coast of Egypt, uh, as you see. My conclusion, uh, uh, advice using geospatial technologies in coastal geomorphology and engineering because it has become very important and the more easier due to the availability and the affordability of data and uh, tools. Uh, and we recommend to use GIS based DSES analysis for special temporal changes over time because it can be used to assess and compute historical changes in the case shoreline in the near future. And it's very important for planning and the conservation.
It's recommended to use advanced geospatial techniques and higher resolution surveying like LIDAR, drone mapping, high resolution satellite imagery for higher precision mapping of coastal erosion and accretion along the Egyptian coasts, ports, inlets, and canals. Thank you very much for your attention and the time and see you later. And I advise uh, all of you to submit your work to our special issues and the top journal remote sensing with a highly rate of uh, 4.8 impact factor. And thank you so much for all. Thank you very much. Uh, I will say that I'm Lukit Musabimushi. I'm going to present our paper entitled Erosion Risk Assessment, Erosion Risk Assessment through sub, sub watershed prioritization in <laughs> the Nyabarongo River catchment in Rwanda. So the presentation has uh, four parts, the introduction, study area, materials and methods, results and conclusion. So erosion like the other hydrologic hazard has attracted the attention of research and research as a plan as well by major danger to a great ecosystem sustainability because it potentially depletes the soil as it can be formed and brings on the environmental issues. Well, the impact of uh, soil erosion is more is, is placing more in developing countries because of that. And that Jelly face, um, Luke. We, I think there is a problem of connection um, uh, with uh, Luke. Jelly, please, can you go ahead? Jelly, please, are you getting me? I think um Hello. Yes, you look uh it seems it like uh, you have a an internet issue. Can you hear me? It's not very me? clear. We, we are getting you, but it is not very clear. I don't know. Um can you the uh, set your internet connection, please? It seems like it is not very good. But try to, to, to go ahead with your presentation, please. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, I, I, I was presenting about the soil erosion susceptibility through subwater prioritization in the Nyabarongo River catchment in Rwanda. So soil erosion, like the other hydrological hazard, has attracted the attention of are, are of many researchers and private whites because it is it is a major it was considered to be a, a, a danger to this agro ecosystem sustainability because it can deplete the soil faster than they can be formed and brings on other environmental issues. So to stop and mitigate those consequences, researchers have proposed to pay attention to soil conservation and sustainable soil management which can be executed by watershed scales. The watershed serves as a geological unit for proper planning and management. However, 
basis, effectiveness cannot be expected. So uh, they recommended to identify regions that they see to uh, So this is commonly called uh, watershed prioritization. Large country improves a watershed and investigate each independently so that critical watershed gets high priority in terms of conservation measures. Generally, generally techniques are commonly used to 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 assess the shared prioritization. Some researchers use the compound parameter index, and others use the AHP, the analytical hierarchy process. But few attempts have been made so far to combine them, to compare them into a single study and check whether they, they, they yield the same outcome. And this was our, this was the research gap that we tried to, to bridge in this, to bridge in this, uh, in this study. So we defined, the, the, the study defined three order clusters using the uh, hierarchy cluster analysis. And those clusters represent sub-watersheds, sub -watershed which were pre-delineated. And the AI technique used four factors, morphometric, morphometric parameters, but given that those morphometric parameters are some high, high in many, they are, they are large. So we tried to, to reduce them using the principal component analysis and only consider those which were found to be correlated. And we use also land cover, soil, and geology data. For, for the second approach, the AHP or erosion hazard rate, erosion hazard rate index, we use four factors, there is, which are soil loss, soil sediment production rates, sediment transport index, runoff on tissue, and slope. So we selected the Nyabarongo River catchment, which is the first larger catchment in Rwanda, draining 33% of the total Rwanda coverage in the small part of, U of southern Uganda. The, the catchment enjoys the tropical, tropical climate, tropical climate characterized by two seasons, wet and dry season. In the mean precipitation of about 1,231 mm per year and uh, about 17 degrees Celsius of temperature. So the altitude, the elevation range from 1,342 to 4,495 meter above the sea level. And uh, Agriculture is the mainstay of the economy of about 90% of the population. And the catchment is vulnerable and susceptible to many geohazards like erosion, landslide, flood, flooding, and others. Here we have the methodological flow, which were, was used to, to assess to assess uh, the, the, the watershed prioritization. Here we have uh, the first approach and there we have the second approach. So the CI or composite, composite index used the morphometric, land cover, soil and geology. While on the other side, <laughs> the erosion hazard rate index used five, five, um, Five factors, soil loss, sediment production rates, sediment transport index, runoff potential, and uh, slope. So let me do this, please. I'm going to say it here. 
Um, here, as the, the watersheds were, were prioritized based uh, at cluster level, so we use many, we use open data sets from different sources, like this DMSRTM was used to delineate first the catchment and its watershed. And based on what we calculated the morphometric parameters. So these morphometric parameters were used to, to group, to group subwatersheds in two clusters using this Yuratrico cluster analysis. Then the morphometric parameters were reduced, were reduced using the statistical analysis, principal component analysis, to only consider those correlated, correlated correlated parameters for the prioritization. So we use also soil texture data set to complete the soil prioritization, land cover geology, and this morphometric. And then we used other, other data sets to calculate the soil loss and the other, and the other, um, and the other, Clusters or subwatershed under uh, subwatershed which recorded low low CI value, low CI value, and give low priority to those recording high CI value. That it's it is bad from from the literature. So on the other side, erosion hazard rate index was uh, calculated based on analytical hierarchy process, which were used to 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 uh, to calculate the relative weights relative weights so the this index was a product of um, of a normalized value of each factor and the its its uh, its specific weights of analytical hierarchy process and at the end we compared the results the results from these two approaches to see whether they yield the same outcome Please go ahead. Thank you. So this, this is, these are the results. The result revealed that Nyambarongo catchment is subdivided in 23 subwater sheds. So using the high hierarchical cluster analysis, we, we group them into three clusters. Here you can see that the cluster one, cluster one, has the maximum number of um, 12. Cluster two has eight subwater sheds, while the minimum number of subwater sheds were observed in cluster three. So here we perform the principal component, component analysis to 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 identify those parameters, those morphometric parameters which were found to be correlated and we when we found that out of 11 out of 17 17 parameters only 11 were found to be correlated with a coefficient of correlation higher than 0 0.9 here you can see they are here dressed in number of of over and flow the, here we have a saturity ratio factor elongation ratio compactness compactness coefficient, sediment delivery ratio, rudeness number, basin shape, and, um, and uh, so I forget it, please. So here we, we ranked, we ranked, um, we ranked each, each, uh, each um, parameter with relationship to, to erodibility or soil erosion. So, and uh, we averaged, the pre preliminary ranking to obtain the compound parameter. Here we have compound parameter of each uh, cluster, of each cluster, and we give high priority to cluster which recorded lowest CP 
value. So uh, considering morphometric prioritization, we can say that subwatersheds under cluster C3 were high priority, while the subwatershed under cluster C1 were low priority. In terms of lens cover, we found that subwatershed C2 were found to be high priority subwatershed Y and, um, and uh, C1 and C3 got the same, got the same, um, got the same value, got the same value. Uh, in terms of soil, in terms of soil, we found that subwatershed under C2, under C2 have got high priority because of lowest CP value. And in terms of geology, the subwatershed under C1 has got high, high priority, while the subwatershed under C2 got lowest priority. So we tried here, I don't see if you can see here, uh, we tried here to make again a average of compound parameter to get index values. And as the compound parameter, lowest, the highest uh, priority were given to Sabota shed, which recorded lowest CI value. And based on this, we found that Sabota shed under C2 has got high priority, while the Sabota shed under C moderate priority and the low priority was given to Sabota shed under C3. So here, here we calculated also, we, we built a, a comparison matrix, pairwise comparison matrix using AHP, and we calculated the relative weights, relative weights, and we checked the consistency of the matrix, uh, and the value was 0 0.05, 0 0.04, which was less than the threshold of 0 0.1, it's me, which means that our relative weights were, was consi were consistent and can be used for the, for the decision. Based on relative weights, soil loss was found to be the most influence, uh, most influence factor to, for watershed prioritization followed by sediment, sediment, um, transport index, then runoff potential and slope. And at last, the sediment production rate come, came at last. So here, we also calculated here, we have original value of each, each factor, original value. But given that the original value can, the, the range of original value might range and which can influence can inf which can have an influence due to its uh, due to its high and low values or range. So we we normalize them. We normalize this norm this original value. Uh, at a, we rescale this of, of, of on a range on a range between zero zero and one zero and one to 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 make them similar to make them similar. So these are normalized values of original values. And then the total normalized value was the product of the relative weights of each, of each factor times the, the normalized value of each cluster, of each cluster. And here we found that cluster C2 has got high value, high total normalized value, which means high value, high priority. Sediment production rates, we found that again, high high value high value which means high priority so the erosion hazard rate index was calculated as a product as a summation of all the calculated as a summation of all total normalized value and found that cluster subwater shed under under cluster c2 has got high priority because of high value, high erosion hazard rate index value. So, we have results and the company.
Phoenix and HP and erosion hazard rating. We lost uh, Luke. Mm. Uh, dear Luke, are you getting me? Yes, I can get you. Yeah, we, we, I would like to uh, tell you that you are out of time. Yes, uh, you I'm, have to I'm, go faster and conclude this. Yes, yeah. we, have, we have a lot of people, a lot of presenters waiting. Thank you. So, so the results when we found that they yield the same outcome. The support shed under C2, under cluster C2, has got high priority, priority, and C1 lowest priority on both approaches. So the, the study attempted to compare the commonly used shed majorization, the CI and uh, erosion hazard rate index based on AHP. And uh, as a main conclusion, we say that they both yield the same outcome. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, dear Luc, uh, for your nice presentation and the intensity of uh, uh, data obtained through your research. I would like the audience to ask any question uh, concerning this presentation of Luke from Rwanda. Thank you so much. Uh, um, just please tell me, can you see my entire presentation? It's visible for everyone. Yeah, very, very, it's very, very visible also. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Renee and I'm at the University of Pretoria. I'm currently doing my master's research project on anthropogeomorphological wetlands. So globally, wetlands are one of the most productive ecosystems. They help for flood attenuation, water storage and carbon sequestration. They're also important for international goals and agreements, for example, in the Ramsar Convention. And we are also celebrating World Wetlands Day on the 2nd of February. So the entire month of February is filled with wetland activities. Unfortunately, more than 50% of the area of certain wetland type have, has been lost during the 20th century. I won't bore you with the details, but this is a very sad situation and we are really losing valuable biodiversities and habitats. In South Africa, our wetlands are fundamentally different in terms of our high potential evapotranspiration, low mean annual rainfall. We have fluvial systems with significantly less water and ephemeral in nature, and our permanent wet systems are primarily dependent on groundwater. So wetlands really is a lifeline. Unfortunately, 60 7% of rivers and wetlands in South Africa are already degraded and many more remain threatened as well. So in terms of the South African legislation, how do we define wetlands? Land which is transitional between terrestrial and aquatic systems where the water table is usually at or near the surface or the land is periodically covered with shallow water and which land is normal circumstances support or would support vegetation typically adapted to life in saturated soils. How do wetlands form? So geomorphological studies of wetlands in drier landscapes are a relatively new field of study as long-term processes are easily neglected in favor for short-term processes related to changes in biota rather than wetland formation but it is important to understand the drivers and water sources of these wetlands. These can give important information on how to further manage the wetland and to stabilize it. There are many drivers, for example, the climate, the hydrology, land cover, topography, geomorphology, and the geology. And we as humans influence each of these drivers. 
So, what is anthropogeomorphology? This refers to the geomorphic process where human activities directly and indirectly modifies the Earth's surface. In terms of wetlands, these can be damming, slow ranges, alien invasive species, urbanization, climate change, and many more. What are anthropogeomorphological wetlands? These systems are wetlands developed and or modified by human activities, whether intentional or unintentional. So my aim of my study is to see the contribution of anthropogenic wetlands in the context of anthropogeomorphology with a specific reference to the diversity of wetlands in South Africa and the provision of eco-services to society. Objective one is to determine variation and range of anthrop anthropogeomorphological wetlands in South Africa, basically to create a database. Secondly, to determine the functionality of these systems in terms of their geomorphology and hydrology processes. And thirdly, to expand on wetland classification to accommodate these man-made systems. How will I choose my study sites? So first of all, the sites need to be recently developed in terms of wetland functions or have a recent rehabilitation structure. It should have well-documented descriptions so that we can have a baseline. Sites need to differ in terms of the sources of anthropogeomorphological processes in order to compare them. For the initial survey, I will be using the 1 to 50,000 topographical map series, which consists of 1,913 sheets, of which 312 sheets will be randomly chosen as a sample size. I will then use Google Earth Pro to look at the historical satellite imagery to see if there's any changes regarding land use and vegetation. This is an example of one of my sites, and we will get back to that a bit later. After I've identified these sites, I will be classifying them in terms of indirect and direct anthropogenic processes. This will hopefully later on help to diverse the classification. So for example, the Hatswane Nature Reserve had a very beautiful wetland that basically formed around 2014. And when we had a look at them, we saw that it was actually a leak from a, a reservoir facility, which basically um, led this beautiful wetland to form. But the water itself was unnatural in terms of it wasn't groundwater, it was actually treated water that we found chloride in. And this water was supposed to go to houses where people lived and used the water for their household activities. So not only did we lose a lot of water, but we also saw that a whole new ecosystem was created. Do these systems actually act as natural wetlands? Can we classify them? In short, yes, we can. We look at certain indicators. This is also according to our Department of Water and Sanitation Delegation guidelines. Are there any wetland soils presenting these systems? Do we see glade characteristics? Do we see that clay has been washed out? Are there mottles, glaying, or any other indicators of presence of water? Where does the water come from? In the previous example, it was an unnatural source. But what happens if people actually influence the topography and only diverted the water? Does this still count? And do we see wetland vegetation? Now, wetland vegetation, basically, yeah, it's one of the indicators that we see most frequently um, appear in a very short period of time. And what does the anthropo say? In other words, us as humans, what do we do with this information? How can we improve our current classification system? And what does our legislation say? Can we use these systems as natural systems? Can we incorporate them in our daily lives? We lost so many natural systems. Can these man-made systems be a, a substitute for them? Are there any international laws that protect them? So yes, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. This is a very interesting topic and I hope to share 
my results with you next year or the year thereafter. I would also like to tell you a bit more about SAG, the Southern African Association of Gymophologists, and SAYG, the Southern African Young Gymophologist Group. Both of these groups work predominantly in Southern Africa, but you are more than welcome to also join us. Membership for the SAYG is totally free, and feel free to um, have a look at our social media pages as well as our website. Thank you so much. Alors, euh, merci beaucoup. Alors, c'est un plaisir pour moi euh, de vous présenter. Euh, Est-ce que vous m'entendez? You hear me? Do you hear me? Oui, OK, oui. ça va être en anglais. Je pense que la majorité des, des, des participants sont des anglophones, mais voilà, donc ma, ma contribution sera en, en français pour être beaucoup plus à l'aise. D'accord, sans souci. Alors, euh, donc je disais que donc, euh, moi, ma contribution porte sur approche, une approche euh, cartographique euh, de l'évolution du trait de code, un peu similaire à ce que mon précédent a, a, a présenté tout à l'heure. Euh, alors, il faut retenir d'abord que cette étude s'inscrit dans un contexte où euh, le littéraire est considéré comme un, 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 un siège de, euh, de beaucoup d'éléments à multiples enjeux conjugués également au effets des changements climatiques qui peuvent parfois être euh, exacerbés par les activités anthropiques. Et l'ensemble de ces éléments-là peuvent donc contribuer à la vulnérabilité des côtes qui, où, où beaucoup d'activités socio-économiques euh, euh, assurent donc la survie de l'humanité. Alors nous, si on prend donc l'exemple de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, on sait que l'Afrique de l'Ouest est, 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 est une sous-région bien menacée par les effets des changements climatiques. Et quand on parle des de, de changements climatiques au niveau des zones côtières, on parle plutôt, on, on a donc une idée donc de l'élévation du niveau de la mer, et mais aussi donc la fréquence des fortes tempêtes euh, et des vagues qui ont donc une vitesse donc de plus de 10 mètres secondes. Euh, et qui donc, peut avoir donc, euh, une, une modification très rapide donc, de, de la morphologie des plages. Alors, au-delà de ça également, on peut parler aussi des caractéristiques euh, de, ces, de ces plages qui, qui peuvent être donc, des, sédiments, euh, des caractéristiques très mobiles et moins consolides, consolidées et qui peuvent être vulnérables donc, à, à l'avancée de la mer, mais aussi à la, la faible topographie. Et la conséquence qui peut en découler, c'est donc l'avancée de la mer, la submersion, mais également donc la salinisation des, euh, des terres. Alors, euh, on peut rappeler quelques éléments d'hydrodynamique, c'est-à-dire donc les houles et les, et les vagues. Donc, au Sénégal, nous avons deux, deux houles euh, qui sont responsables un peu de la, de la dynamique sédimentaire, soit en engraissement ou les régions, mais aussi des courants et qu'elles qu qu euh, qu induisent. Euh, en Casamance, donc euh, situé au sud donc, du, euh, du Sénégal, nous avons donc euh, deux types de vagues, les vagues du nord-ouest également, et puis par euh, ces, ces mêmes eaux-là, qui sont donc euh, environ euh, 20%, qui, et qui sont présentes donc, pendant toute l'année, mais beaucoup plus euh, euh, fortes donc, entre donc, euh, euh, décembre et, et avril. Euh, et de l'autre Également, d'autres vagues beaucoup plus courtes qui sont donc euh, entre, septembre, entre juillet et septembre, mais aussi qui, sont, euh, donc, qui, qui occupent donc, 45% de ces, de, ces, de, ces, de ces vagues. Il y a également d'autres éléments tels que la dérive littorale et qui sont donc euh, autant d'éléments qui peuvent donc, contribuer donc, à la mort de des plages. Alors, L'objectif de cette étude, après avoir rappelé quelques éléments donc, qui sont à l'origine euh, de, 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 de la morphologie, de la morphodynamique des plages, est donc de proposer une approche euh, cartographique euh, de la cinématique du, du, du trait de code pour répondre un peu aux besoins d'approfondir les connaissances au-delà d'une des approches parfois très classiques où nous avons donc euh, euh, les descentes sur le terrain, les mesures, les, les mesures et donc les approches purement géomorphologiques ici. Donc, il s'agit de combiner à la fois donc, ces, deux, ces deux approches pour, pour mieux comprendre et renforcer un peu les connaissances en termes d'analyse spatiale. Alors, le, la zone d'étude se situe au Sénégal, notamment à l'extrême sud-ouest du, euh, de ce pays-là, c'est-à-dire la Casamance. 
Elle est limitée donc au nord par la République, donc euh, par, la, par la Gambie et au sud par la, par la, par la, par la République de la Guinée-Bissau. Alors, euh, comme données et méthodes, il, il s'agit donc de mettre en, en place donc, une approche euh, euh, mettant en exergue, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, les travaux de terrain, mais aussi les travaux et, et aussi les études de la de la de l'analyse spatiale, c'est-à-dire la géomatique. Ici, nous avons utilisé globalement les les images satellites, donc du fait donc de la gratuité euh, et de, de la gratuité de, de leur gratuité et de leur facilité, la facilité donc de leur accessibilité. Et donc euh, tous ont des mêmes résolutions spatiales à des tant mètres, mais pour choisir ces, ces, ces images-là, il faut d'abord avoir une observation donc de la zone d'étude pour voir est-ce que c'est dynamique, c'est très dynamique en fait. Donc si c'est une zone moins dynamique, on n'allait pas pouvoir les choisir parce que tout simplement donc euh, euh, il y aura donc une marche, une marche des règles qui peuvent donc biaiser les informations. Alors la, cinéma, la cinématique ici. Il s'agit de quoi Il s'agit de mettre en, en place une méthode statistique d'extrapolation et de calcul des tendances et pour euh, baser sur une superposition d'images. Mais avant tout cela, il faut d'abord définir euh, le référentiel qui va être utilisé. Donc, nous avons plusieurs lignes de référence, on peut avoir plus d'une douzaine. Mais en fonction de l'objet et de la morphologie des places, nous avons utilisé ici donc, euh, la ligne instantanée. Donc, euh, de... euh, qu'est-ce que j'ai dit encore C'est la limite de la végétation qui est utilisée. Alors, euh, donc ici, nous avons donc euh, plusieurs les, les éléments euh, qui constituent un peu les lignes de référence qui, qui peuvent être utilisées. Et l'extraction de la ligne de référence est faite à partir donc, de, euh, de, de, de la interprétation assistée par l'ordinateur ici. Alors, très rapidement, donc, toujours dans la méthodologie, nous avons également euh, l'outil euh, digital sur la un analyse système, donc comme l'a dit mon prédécesseur ici. Il s'agit donc de cet outil-là qui permet donc de faire des calculs, entre, des, des écarts entre les traits de code qui sont déjà digitalisés. Il faut d'abord faire donc également une opération de calcul, c'est-à-dire créer une de, de database personnelle qui, constitue, qui, qui est constituée de trois éléments ou bien de trois entités, c'est-à-dire la ligne de base sur laquelle donc, euh, les, les, les transacts vont prendre en euh, source mais aussi les shorelines, c'est-à-dire les, 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 les traits de code qui ont été déjà digitalisés dans un autre environnement, et de créer une zone de tampon également pour stabiliser, pour stabiliser l'environnement dans lequel le calcul est, euh, est réalisé. Donc, euh, le calcul se fait à partir donc, des, des transits qui sont perpendiculaires donc, à la ligne de base qu'on a déjà créée et qui permettent de mesurer les écarts entre donc, les traits de code. Nous avons ici donc, ces, ces transits qui, sont, qui peuvent être brut et qui peuvent être parfois à traiter. Alors, au-delà de ça également, il faut chercher des indices. Chaque indice a, a, a sa pertinence. Par exemple, entre les écarts, les écarts euh, entre les intervalles intermédiaires, EPR est donc l'indice le, le plus pertinent. Et au-delà de ça également, pour faire donc euh, une évolution synthétique donc de, de l'année A à l'année l'année la, la plus ancienne à l'année la plus récente, nous avons donc ce, euh, ce, le deuxième indice qui est beaucoup plus pertinent. Mais quelle que soit aussi la, la superposition d'images, quelle que soit l'étude qui menée, et, 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 si, si elle est basée sur une superposition d'images, il y a également les masses d'erreurs qui peuvent être, euh, qui peuvent biaiser le, euh, les résultats et les, les, les principales Ceci des sont donc les reliés au géoréférencement, les reliés donc à la variation du niveau euh, de l'oscillation et les reliés donc liés à, au, 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 à, la, à la numérisation, c'est-à-dire que la, la, la digitalisation. Alors, il y a donc une formule qui permet donc de, de, de calculer ces erreurs-là et qui peut donc, à partir de là, nous allons intégrer un peu les, les, les erreurs au niveau donc, de l'interprétation des résultats. Alors, quelques éléments de résultats donc, de cette cartographie. Nous avons donc une, la première période, c'est-à-dire entre 2004 et 2007. Nous avons globalement un taux d'évolution globalement compris entre la marche des au niveau donc, de la partie, la partie c'est-à-dire la partie proximale d'un peu donc, des. Euh, le segment proximal donc de la, de la, de la presqu'île donc du, du, des, des oiseaux mais au sud nous avons donc une, 
une, une forte érosion comprise jusqu'à entre 57,97 mètres par an. Donc, cette partie-là est exposée donc au, au, aux agents hydrodynamiques. Nous avons ici également entre, entre 2008 et 2012, Également, nous avons aussi une, euh, une dynamique globalement caractérisée par un déficit sédimentaire, mais cependant une variation irrégulière donc, de, de la ligne de dépasse. Donc, ça, ça, pas, donc euh, nous n'avons pas une tendance globalisée, mais des variations par, par segment. Euh, toujours est-il, donc, entre 2012 et 2016 également, nous avons une situation similaire à la première, c'est-à-dire euh, les résultats qui sont parfois euh, compris entre la matrice, ça veut dire qu'on ne sait pas ce qu'il ce qu y a eu exactement malgré donc, les, les significations ou bien les, les, les traductions que ça, ça nous donne. Nous avons également la dernière période, donc euh, la dernière période entre 2016 et 2019 également, nous avons une dynamique, euh, bon là c'est pas similaire plutôt, c'est donc une dynamique caractérisée par donc, la partie sud qui était caractérisée par une une forte érosion et donc euh, et, euh, a connu donc une situation où on ne connaît pas en fait donc la situation qui est donc de 5 mètres qui est comprise entre la masse de donc ici la seule euh, partie donc c'est euh, l'île de la goélette qui a donc qui, est, qui a donc une valeur qui est supérieure à la masse de c'est à dire 12,7 mètres par an alors là, ça c'est donc c'est la carte de synthèse qui montre ici nous avons donc euh, bon, ça c'est une erreur de, de ma part, donc c'est une dynamique similaire qui vient toujours dans l'animation, mais c'est pas ça exactement. Nous avons donc, si on considère, on sait que donc c'est la partie plutôt sud qui est donc la, la partie qui est plus exposée donc à ces, à ces phénomènes-là où nous avons donc parfois une dynamique sédimentaire, parfois progress, euh, une forte pression au niveau donc euh, de la pointe de, de, la, de la deuxième flèche, mais une euh, une, une, une très forte euh, érosion entre, donc, au niveau donc, de la, de, de la sur sud Cela nous permet donc de voir euh, visuellement les éléments donc, euh, qui, qui traduisent cette, cette, cette dynamique de demandé, c'est-à-dire une vitesse de l'érosion marine dans certains endroits qui ne permettent pas donc, à, à, au, au, à la végétation qui a été reboisée pour fixer un peu les, les dunes. Mais également, donc, cette dynamique sédimentaire n'est pas, pas seulement donc, euh, régressive parce que nous avons parfois donc, dans l'ensemblement euh, au niveau donc, des zones de mangrove qui ne qui permettent pas, donc, euh, qui permettent pas donc, à, à la mangrove donc, de, de grandir comme, comme, comme il le faut. Alors, en conclusion, pour dire que le littoral de la Casamance est, donc, intègre plusieurs euh, processus morphodynamiques et donc des changements sociaux environnementaux. Et nous avons donc l'existence de ces flèches sableuses qui sont sous l'influence euh, de ces houles-là qui peuvent donc traduire un peu cette dynamique sédimentaire. À côté de ces évolutions, de, de ces évolu des, des évolutions des flèches sableuses que nous avons ici, nous avons donc cette variation par en bas de cette côte qui peuvent donc avoir des conséquences sur la vie socio-économique. Donc ce qui se traduit par notamment la modification parfois très rapide sur les unités morphologiques et donc euh, qui font donc que ce, ce littoral est exposé donc à ces agents hydrodynamiques puisque donc c'est une zone euh, à dominance donc euh, rizicole nous avons donc une dégradation des torts qui peut peut-être donc avoir donc euh, des conséquences très euh, néfastes sur la vie donc sur l'activité socio-économique des populations le tourisme également balère qui est donc une euh, activité très répandue dans cette zone là donc on est donc la réduction ou bien la, le rétrécissement du trait de côte peut avoir des conséquences sur euh, les infrastructures touristiques et voilà nous vous remercions Ok, clear now. Perfect. Full screen, please. Ok. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all. I am Noura Hamdi Fayyad, a teaching assistant at the Manwari University, Egypt, and the master's degree student at University of Brumriska, Cuba, Slovenia. My research is about geomorphing the hazard of Sanur Cave, Eastern Desert, Egypt. Introduction. Carries the hazard and a uh, are an important example of natural hazards. They occur in an, er, in an area with soluble rocks, carbonates, mostly limestone, dolomites, and chalk. 
sulfate mostly gypsum and anhydride, chloride mostly rock salt and potassium salt, and some stalactite quartz and amorphous silicious sediments, and efficient underground drainage. Karis is one of the environment in the world's most vulnerable of natural and human induced hazards. <clears throat> Location Sanur Cave is located, uh, is located as a part of Wadi Sanur near the village of Sanur, Venezuela, Upper Egypt. It lays on the east bank of the Nile River, less than 20 kilometers from the river and the east, uh, uh, east desert of Egypt. It extends a distance of about Seven, uh, 700 meter, which is about 15 meter, and depth is about 15 meter. This is map of Egypt, and this is the city of Venezuela, and we can see here this Sanur cave near the near the city here. <clears throat> Good location. As we know, Sanur cave is a protected area. So when we go to the study area, we take an assignment from the government. No one can enter this area before get an assignment from the government. And we provide us with a guide to enter this, uh, to enter this area. No one can enter with, uh, with himself because the area was, was difficult and they can, we use a car four by four to enter this area. And, it, uh, and, uh, and another we can walk for half an hour to reach to the cave here. Sanur cave, was <clears throat> Sanur, cave. Sanur cave was discovered in the 1980s after blast blasting in the quarry creating an entrance. And some research says that Sanur cave was discovered in 1990s. And Sanur cave, were, uh, were, uh, Sanur cave uh, is the third cave in the world. So it's a great cave. <clears throat> and it's 10 kilometers southeast of the city of Venezuela, and it may be 200 kilometers from the Cairo. Uh, it is only one chamber, which are about 700 meters long, uh, along, and 15 meters in diameter. And it is divided into two parties, one of which contain complete, uh, complete formation stalactite and stalagmite, and the another contain calcium deposits in different forms. And some researchers say that it uh, believes that there is another cave under this cave and there is not discovered until now. Uh, cave of Sanur, it's a limestone cave overlaid with alabaster created by thermal spring. It's anti geology and the beautiful formation of a stalactite and stalagmite, led it to be recognized as a protected area in 1992. Objectives this paper aim to define the geomorphological characteristics of the cave and study geomorphological hazards which facing opening the cave of the, for the visitor. And this photo for this cave and say we can see, oh sorry, we can see here the stalactite and the stalagmite in this cave. Message. Extensive field study and geomorphic mapping of the geomorphological hazard of the cave. Geology, the plateau has an irregular outline with elevation of approximately 305 meters above the abutimentus, the gabel. The gabel hamro bone has the highest altitude, 334 meters. The plateau is made of limestone and marble beads. Memories is twist oriented with this drain, the plateau. The upper pediments extend parallel to the scarp of scarp face bounding the plateau, whereas the lower our, our uh, the lower one our locks. The Nile traces uh, to the west. The Palaya sediment was classified into conglomerate and the Nile traces. So this is the geological map for the area, and we can see here the contain of the geological map. 
Geomorphology, geomorphology the, cave has, the cave has a geomorphological features such as stalagmite and stalactite and stalagmite columns and carnitines, in addition to surface bosses of the three rosa, three rosa were recognized in the cave's floor, as well as some sinkholes. The cave is overlaid with alabaster that has been brought by the thermal spring, and the chamber is made of limestone. Normally, we know that alabaster refers to fine grain calcium, or sulfate, or gypsum, but this, but this term oriental or Egyptian alabaster was introduced before maybe in 94 uh, for the cristalline uh, calcium carbonates of the Nile. The Nur Cave is a classic cave, cave created by groundwater particulate uh, through the Eocene limestone of the Galala Plateau. Uh, Eocene limestone may be around 40 or 50 million years old with some interpreted shells. And this is a photo for sulfite and the sulfite and the some columns and uh, crankings. It's out this geomorphic hazard. Rock fall from the cave wells, uh, ceiling, and entrance. This photo so uh, see us that the staircase. This staircase is near to rock falls. A rock we can see that rock filling rocks block inside the cave. So I will see you the whole of the opening of the cave. This, this is the enter. This the opening of the middle of the cave, and it's leading, leading, uh, it's loading to and uh, it's loading to the cave. And it uh, there a wooden stair, a wooden staircase that extends three for uh, three floors down. We, we can enter the cave from this uh, opening. And this opening is very, very small and to, it's very dangerous to enter from it. So this warden here was very dangerous because it may be uh, damaged in any time if fall rocks uh, cutting. Okay. And Enter the cave through the quarry vertical deep hole. This hole in the earth is approximately 50 meters in diameter. It is close to being around and 50 meters deep with a near circular column in the center. This, this one, raising right to the original surface. This column in the middle of it. The weeding of the horizontal and the vertical rock, uh, rocky joints and the leakage of rain water through them. We can see here the photo horizontal joint of, uh, on the entrance and we saw a lot of horizontal uh, of entrance because the rain uh, make a lot of this and the moisture uh, also. The entry of the rainwater into the joint and delete their expansion and inside the cave and work to dissolve with the calendrious material between the rocks. So it works to very uh, presence of mud in the floor of the cave. Mud both mud the bosses on the floor and this horizontal joint inside the cave. This mud make our step in the cave very difficult because if you uh, walk, uh, walk quickly, you will drop. So we can we was very careful when we uh, take another step when we walk. Also, quick and exploration of uh, alabaster carries broke some of the catastrophe and uh, extent expanded of the joint. So there were many blocks that are born to collapse at any time. And the cave was exposed to flash flood in 1994 that caused the water to enter the cave and the, uh, and the some 
the same was repeated in 1995, maybe in March. After that, the cave was closed and no effort is doing it. This is some broken stalactite. And when we enter the cave with Dr. Magdi, we see that uh, some research come, so, uh, some research, researcher cutting of some stalactite uh, for make uh, analysis for it. During the rain, lemon stone dissolve it in the lemon and clay, and the moisture makes the, makes the same on it. Dissolve it lemon stone in the clay. The brick chart joints and the strata bedding surface causes the water stratted uh, rocks inside the cave. Like here. This is our guide in uh, the area, in the cave. Conclusion. The North Cave is exposed to some natural hazards that threaten uh, its visitor and there is for it has been closed to visitor and the cave should be mentioned and protected. The cave, the importance of this cave due to the scarcity of this natural formation in the world and the reser reserve is considered anti global cultural site for researcher and the studies uh, as in studies in the field of geography, uh, geology not geography, our, our geography also. And these studies will help, uh, help you to discover future mineral resources. Thank you for your uh, listening and your attention. And may, I hope my research is clear for us and I am ready now for any question. Okay. Uh, the title of our work is Multimodal Analysis of Soil Erosion Susceptibility Areas and the Causative Factors in Anambra State, Southeast please, Nigeria. Please, uh, please, uh, please, uh, please Romanus, can you put it in full screen mode, please? Can I do what? Full screen mode. Full screen. Full screen mode, okay. Yeah, yeah just down. And if, you change, and if you change his name to Romanus, not the... No, it is just um, before okay. before the percentage. Before the percentage, there's an icon there. You just have to, to set the icon. No, no, not here. Before the percentage of your screen. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, can I go ahead? Um, if you can't put it in full screen mode, please just go ahead. But okay. uh, zoom out, please zoom out to see your, your slide. Okay, I'm going to do that. Try to go ahead, please. You have to. Is it okay this way? Uh, you must zoom out, I think. Zoom out. Please go to 100%, it will be better. 100%, just 100%. Okay. One hundred, one, one, one hundred. One hundred, please. Yes. 
try to present it because we are we are we are, we are wasting our time. Please go ahead. So I should go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, natural hazards can cause natural disaster. Soil erosion is a natural geologic and geophologic hazard. It occurs when soil erosion agents like wind and generated rain runoff disintegrate and remove the surface layers of the soil. Soil erosion, which includes splash, sheet erosion, rail, and goily erosion, out of which goily is the most devastating in our study area. Goily erosion has become endemic in our study area, and it has posed serious challenge to many scientists, including environmental management, environmental, environmental scientists and uh, geoscientists. Previous researches have identified the causes of this goily erosion in our study area. But efforts made by government and other non-governmental agencies to militate against this soil erosion menace has proved to achieve little. Hence, the need to model susceptibility areas in the state so that it will help us in land use management in this area. Our study area is Anambra State, southeastern Nigeria, located between latitude six degrees and seven degrees north, and longitude seven, longitude six degrees for five minutes and seven degrees 20 minutes east, covering an area of about 4,844 4, kilometers square. It lies within the humid tropical rainforest belt of West Africa. Although human activities have led to loss of the original ecosystem and biodiversity, accelerating the menace of soil erosion in the states. The study area experiences two distinct seasons, rainy season starting from April to October and dry season starting from November to March. Research methodology. This research as designed use secondary data and other data, other data from literature, which includes satellite imagery, topographic sheets, and other journals. Data extracted from uh, satellite imagery Includes NDVI normalized difference vegetation index, land surface temperature, liniment density, slope length, erosion density, digital elevation model, and soil moisture index, drainage density, slope angle, and K factor, which is a erodibility factor. ArcGIS 10.2 and SPSS software we are used to analyze, determine, and predict the contributions of various factors to soil erosion susceptibility in the study area. You can see our flow chart. It shows where we got our data from NIMET, which is a Nigerian metro, a metrological institution, and what we did with the data and the outcome of the use of the data. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> so we, we use rainfall data from NIMET 
and we use a satellite satellite images from USGS. We obtained shape file of Nigeria and Anambra states from Diva GIS and exported same to ArcGIS. From, from the ArcGIS, we processed our data and extracted the causative factors, which we earlier listed, including uh, NDVI, LST, LD, LS, EDM, DEM, SEMI, GD, and SLA and K factor. So we reclassified the values of our causative factors into five. We then grade them into very low to very high and assign percentages and integrated these values of the percentages to produce soil susceptibility map using weighted overlay method in ArcGIS. After which we went for validation in the field. The maps that resulted from this exercise are shown, you could see them. The maps are for the susceptibility map. Uh, and we came up with a one general map being the model, which we named CESA, Soil Susceptibility, Soil Erosion Susceptibility Area, SESA, by adding the causative factors, the outcome of the causative factors to produce a one single map showing the areas that are prone or susceptible to erosion in Anambra states. We also went further to show predicting ability of the variables using regression analysis, which the result is presented on the table. Looking at it, you see that our significant level is 0.0. .0 Four, four, which is less than 0 0.05, showing that the model is significant and that the outcome of the analysis is not by chance. The variables are also linear at 0 0.783, while R square at 0 0.613, which is 61.3%. Showing that the independent variables explains 61.3% of the dependent variable. We went further to look at the coefficient table where the beta constant is 0 0.187. Before changes that occurred, we are noticed. Looking at other variables of looking at other values of the variable, it means that any unit change in any of the independent variable will either increase or decrease the dependent variable depending on the mathematical sign. In conclusion, the research was able to identify areas that, that are most vulnerable. And the research also model this area for visual specificity, which is very necessary to curb the menace of soil erosion. We also had it that uh, if we understand this concept and have knowledge of these vulnerable areas, it will help in directing the suitable land use activities in the study area. And it will, in other, in other way, it will avoid to help us to avoid scenarios where soil erosion, that is a natural hazard, turns into a natural disaster in the states. Thank you for listening. Donc, euh, bonjour tout le monde. Donc, aujourd'hui, je vais vous présenter euh, mon mémoire de master intitulé 
études et cartographies géomorphologiques des mouvements de terrain sur la bordure nord de Saint-Clinal Perché du Balgora, nord-ouest tunisien. Donc, euh, donc, cette présentation est composée de trois parties. Euh, en premier lieu, je vais vous présenter les caractéristiques du milieu naturel favorable au mouvement de terrain. En deuxième lieu, je vais vous présenter les différents types de mouvements de terrain repérés dans le secteur d'études de Jbalgora. Et la dernière partie, ça sera consacré à l'étude de la relation au milieu naturel. C'est euh, l'homme face au risque des mouvements de terrain. Donc, euh, donc le secteur d'études est situé dans la zone, donc est situé au hôtel tunisien. Donc, le hôtel, c'est au nord-ouest de la Tunisie. Euh, il s'agit euh, donc, euh, donc le, est situé, donc, euh, comme j'ai dit, donc, au, à hôtel tunisien. Euh, donc, au cours, on va s'intéresser, euh, excusez-moi, juste... Donc, et donc, cette région est bien individualisée par euh, la structure inversée de ses principaux euh, Jbel, dont Jbel Gora est fait partie. Donc, il s'agit d'un synclinal perché euh, qui s'étend de sud-ouest nord-est sur une distance d'environ euh, 7 km. Euh, donc, au cours de cette étude, on va s'intéresser seulement au versant euh, nord qui s'étend sur une superficie d'environ 35 km et qui domine la rive sud de la moyenne euh, vallée d'Oued Majorda. Administrativement, donc, ce versant euh, du Jbalgora appartient à la délégation euh, de Tibar et il abrite l'agglomération du Djeba. Donc, c'est au nord ouest de la Tunisie. Donc, euh, notre objectif, objectif de ce travail est d'étudier les facteurs euh, responsables euh, à l'instabilité du terrain, étudier et cartographier donc, euh, les formes des mouvements de terrain et, euh, et chercher la relation entre euh, l'homme et le milieu naturel et définir les zones à différents niveaux de risque et établir une carte de risque. Donc, pour atteindre ces objectifs, on a adopté une méthodologie qui associe à la fois les travaux de terrain, les recherches bibliographiques, l'exploitation des documents cartographiques et photographiques. Ainsi, euh, on a réalisé euh, donc, euh, une carte de risque et on a euh, relevé donc, les, différents, donc, les sites instables euh, par euh, GPS. On a réalisé aussi deux enquêtes socio-économiques pour connaître, étudier la relation en milieu naturel. Donc, je vais commencer par les caractéristiques du milieu naturel favorable au mouvement de terrain. Donc, le secteur d'études est dégagé dans un euh, cadre euh, topographique accidenté. Les altitudes sont assez élevées. Elles culminent à à peu près 963 euh, mètres d'altitude. Le versant est très irrégulier, surmonté par une paroi rocheuse bien marquée dans le paysage. Euh, L'irrégularité euh, du versant est bien montrée euh, à partir du profil topographique. Ici, on a euh, donc euh, la paroi rocheuse, un versant irrégulier et la plaine euh, de Tebar. Donc ici, l'irrégularité du versant est bien montrée euh, donc, euh, par six profils topographiques. On voit ici euh, vers 600 à 700 euh, mètres d'altitude, ces profils montrent tous un replat euh, topographique donc, euh, qui donne au versant donc, euh, son, euh, la morphologie donc, euh, en gradin et en, en escalier. Euh, les pentes sont souvent euh, très raides et s'adoucissent euh, vers euh, la plaine. 
on remarque deux alignements euh, de pente très fortes qui sont toujours euh, qui sont très fortes, euh, plus de 27 euh, degrés. Et euh, on, on a les replats qui présentent les pentes euh, douces qui sont toujours recherchées par l'homme pour s'installer. Donc, de point de vue euh, léthologique, euh, le secteur d'étude est dégagé dans un binôme de roches dures calcaires de la formation Mitlaoui euh, et, et euh, une assise marneuse de la formation El Haria, c'est la roche tendre. Donc, le contraste lithologique entre roche dure et roche tendre en aval et un des facteurs favorisant le déclenchement des mouvements de terrain sur le versant nord du Val El Gora. Donc, de point de vue euh, tectonique, le secteur d'étude est situé euh, dans la zone des Diapires, un domaine structural qui se caractérise par le remonté euh, triasique. Ceci a participé à l'apparition d'un réseau, euh, donc, un réseau euh, de failles affectant le calcaire de euh, l'éocène. Ces accidents tectoniques constituent des zones de faiblesse structurelle qui vulnérabilisent les formations affleurantes vis-à-vis -vis au mouvement de terrain. Donc, euh, pour les caractéristiques pluviométriques, donc, euh, donc la pluviométrie est assez abondante, la moyenne annuelle est environ 580 mm avec une place prépondérante à la neige. Le régime pluviométrique est souvent irrégulier, les pluies sont euh, à caractère torrentiel, les pluies journalières. Ce type de pluie provoque le déclenchement des phénomènes en rapport avec l'érosion hydrique ainsi que l'instabilité du versant. Ici, on a un exemple de l'effet de la pluie de 31 mars 2019, creux de Oued Boukhalfa situé euh, à la plaine de, de Tébar, au niveau de la plaine de Tébar. Euh, les caractéristiques hydrographiques, donc euh, le versant est, donc, appartient euh, à, au bassin versant de Oued Tebar. Ce, euh, ce bassin versant présente un réseau hydrographique très dense et très, euh, tr euh, donc très dense, avec euh, la présence des sources d'eau qui jaillissent euh, sur le versant euh, nord du Balgora, au contrebas de la paroi rocheuse, en contact euh, de la roche dure et de la roche tendre. Euh, donc, ces sources vont entraîner l'imbibation de la roche dure et certainement elle va entraîner donc, euh, donc les glissements de terrain. Les caractéristiques du milieu euh, naturel montrent le caractère vulnérable de versant nord du Jbal Gora et euh, la dynamique géomorphologique, en particulier celle des mouvements de terrain. Euh, les mouvements de terrain variés, donc euh, en se basant sur les... Euh, le, les observations directes de terrain et les critères de classification adoptés par les géomorphologues comme Avenar, Flagello, Caray et El Aroui en 2016, on a distingué deux types de mouvements, deux familles de mouvements de terrain, les mouvements de déplacement brusque et instantané et les glissements de terrain. Les mouvements de déplacement brusque et instantané sont essentiellement au contrebas de la paroi rocheuse, c'est-à-dire en amont. Par contre, les glissements de terrain sont repérés euh, en bas, en, à, à, à l'aval de, euh, du versant. Les mouvements de déplacement plus qu'instantanés sont de type iboli et éboulement, des basculements rocheuses. Par contre, les glissements de terrain, on, on a deux types de glissements repérés, donc les glissements profonds et le glissement localisé. Donc, euh, parmi les... Donc, euh, on a les ébolies, donc euh, juste excusez-moi, voilà. Donc les mouvements de déplacement plus qu'instantanés euh, 
premier type, ce sont les ébolies. Donc, euh, les ébolies, euh, euh, on, le, on les trouve partout dans le secteur de Tchud. Et ce, le, donc, le versant nord de Jvalgora est par ex excellence un site où se prolifèrent les mouvements de type ébolie. On les trouve sous forme de cône d'ébolie ou bien des tabliers d'ébolie euh, au contrebas de la paroi. Et parfois, on, on les trouve... Euh, au fond des couloirs euh, ouverts par euh, les falles. Ici, on, on voit un exemple donc d'un couloir d'un couloir assez large et euh, les ébolies euh, atterrit au fond de ce couloir de ce couloir. Les basculements rocheux, donc euh, les basculements rocheux sont un, un peu partout. On trouve des ponts du calcaire détachés des grands pont de calcaire détaché de la paroi rocheuse au contrebas euh, de la paroi euh, au contrebas de, de la paroi rocheuse donc euh, les des, des ponts du calcaire se détachent s'écroulent et se glissent euh, dans euh, sur les mâts euh, ici on a un autre exemple de d'un basculement euh, rocheux donc ici, vous voyez donc la paroi rocheuse euh, et euh, un pan du calcaire détaché de la paroi euh, rocheuse. Il est euh, donc euh, euh, situé d'environ 650 mètres de, de la paroi. Il est glissé sur les mares. Donc, les glissements successifs des ponts du calcaire ont donné au versant une morphologie en escalier et ils vont donner des replats. Euh, ces replats, c'est une platitude exploitée par les agriculteurs. Ils forment des francs secondaires des bolis. Donc, euh, ces ponts ils vont être, bien sûr, écroulés ils vont donner des, des ébolis. Euh, donc, euh, deuxième front d'ébolis. Les glissements de terrain ils sont liés au franchissement de la roche tendre de sa limite de liquidité et de la pl plasticité. Euh, ils sont repérés au camp, euh, donc, euh, à l'aval du versant. Ils sont de type glissement superficiel, affectant le versant d'une façon généralisée. Ici, on, on a des exemples des loupes de soliflexion. Et euh, on a des, aussi, on peut repérer les glissements euh, profonds de type loupe de glissement et des glissements rotationnels et en planche. Ici, on a un exemple, donc, euh, à l'extrémité nord-ouest du versant du Jbal El Gora, euh, des loupes de glissement bien repérées par les mages satellites. Donc, euh, L'homme face au risque des mouvements de terrain, donc euh, l'occupation humaine est très ancienne dans le secteur d'études et euh, l'impact de l'homme sur le versant nord du Valgora a commencé à être considérable à partir du 19e siècle avec l'extension des terres agricoles aux dépens euh, aux zones à risque. Ici, on a deux cartes d'occupation euh, du sol entre 1957 et 1990. On voit bien donc l'extension des terres agricoles. Donc euh, la beauté du paysage euh, a, donc, euh, euh, résulte donc à, on a une euh, un parc euh, au Djebba, crié donc euh, au dépens de, du versant nord euh, du Jbal Gora. Donc, euh, afin de comprendre le comportement euh, de l'homme face au risque, deux enquêtes socio-économiques ont été euh, réalisées auprès des habitants et des visiteurs euh, de ce parc. Le dépouillement de fiches des enquêtes a montré une conscience plus ou moins importante de la population 
locale vis-à-vis -vis au risque d'instabilité, surtout les agriculteurs. Euh, et aussi, euh, cette enquête a montré que l'homme, par certains comportements, en train de déstabiliser davantage son euh, milieu. Donc, l'importance de risques liés euh, au mouvement euh, de terrain a été euh, révélée par une présentation euh, cartographique basée sur une approche géomorphologique, euh, c'est-à-dire euh, en se basant sur, essentiellement sur les observations euh, de terrain. L'élaboration d'une carte de risque a nécessité euh, la réalisation de la carte d'ALIA et une carte de vulnérabilité. L'estimation de l'ALIA a été effectuée d'une manière qualitative par l'identification des facteurs permanents euh, et la vulnérabilité par l'identification des enjeux et l'estimation des conséquences d'un mouvement de terrain sur les, les enjeux identifiés. Euh, le croisement d'ALIA et de la vulnérabilité a permis de définir trois zones de risque. Euh, donc, la zone... Euh, à risque très fort, c'est en rouge. Euh, donc, cette zone concerne la partie nord-ouest du versant qui se caractérise par une activité de mouvement de terrain et une présence humaine très euh, considérable, très remarquable. Donc, euh, l'essentiel des habitants, euh, donc l'essentiel des habitats se, se trouve dans cette partie. Donc, ici, on, a, on va trouver euh, donc le risque fort. Euh, donc, euh, cette partie, donc, ils seront donc, euh, les habitats seront donc exposés au risque des ibolis et au, des basculements, au risque de, de basculement rocheux. Cette zone donc, nécessite une intervention urgente qui doit toucher surtout la paroi rocheuse du Jbel ou dépend euh, des secteurs les plus fracturés. Euh, les autres secteurs euh, dégagent des risques moyens à faibles. Ceux-ci reviennent à l'absence de l'homme, euh, même si euh, des mouvements de terrain sont repérés. Euh, donc, euh, il reste donc cette zone est euh, à risque, à risque donc faible euh, au moyen, vu l'absence de l'homme. Donc, l'identification des secteurs les plus menacés par le risque, ainsi la connaissance de leurs caractéristiques géomorphologiques, m'a permis de proposer quelques aménagements qui devraient surtout toucher directement la paroi euh, rocheuse. Donc, euh, deux méthodes de protection ont été distinguées. La protection euh, active qui consiste à empêcher les blocs de se détacher. Euh, par exemple, citons l'exemple de filets euh, métalliques. Euh, contre, donc, contre la paroi rocheuse et les ponts du calcaire disloqués. Euh, la protection passive consiste à réduire les conséquences de chute de bloc et empêcher leur progression. Par exemple, défiler par bloc, comme cet exemple, donc, cette, euh, cette image. Donc, euh, les filets par bloc peuvent être installés au contrebas de la paroi rocheuse pour protéger les enjeux en aval. Donc, euh, pour conclure, donc, euh, les facteurs d'instabilité sont surtout euh, naturels. Ils sont liés à la disposition lithologique, euh, la structure, euh, aux caractéristiques topographiques et pluviométriques et hydrographiques. Les mouvements les plus spectaculaires et qui ont profondément marqué le paysage sont les mouvements de déplacement brusque et instantané et il présente le risque majeur. La situation sur le versant nord du Valgora semble être très inquiétante, surtout dans sa partie nord-ouest, abritant l'agglomération de Djeba. En effet, l'essentiel des habitations et les vergers sont exposés directement au risque. Donc, ce versant appelle donc une intervention urgente, surtout au niveau des zones à risque élevé qui coïncident souvent avec les secteurs les plus recherchés par les visiteurs de la région. Et merci pour votre attention. So now I'm talk, going to talk about the brief on the evolution of the 
uh, landscape of Rwanda. And then I share this one because of uh, it's very much relationship with the structure, both lithology and uh, structures. I mean, which really characterizes mainly relatively young landscapes. Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about the geology of Rwanda, the landscape overview, the East African Rift Valley, and the associated volcanism. And then I talk about the, the various landscapes uh, in Rwanda. Okay, so the, this geologic map indicates Rwanda is here. So if you can see my, so this is Rwanda, and it has really uh, not a very complicated geology. So this one is granite. And then here you have, uh, uh, it's, it's the, we call them Kiban rocks. They are mainly schists and um, sandstones and quartzites. And then here you have a relatively old landscape. I'm not going to talk too much about it, but just to bear this in mind, uh, to see the, the effect of lithology and structure on the current land form of Rwanda. So that's the geology of Rwanda. Uh, the red, the red and the deep red are the granites and uh, the greens and some of these yellows are the, the meta sediments. And then, um, yeah, generally, and then here you have a mixture of the granite mainly intruded by, sorry, the old meta sediments intruded by uh, granite. Okay. So generally in uh, the Rwandan landscape, Rwanda is about here. Well, it's bigger than this. This was a study area of some work we are doing, but the Rwanda is about here. And so you can see generally it's on an It's an, uh, so we, uh, it's on an elevated part of the Eastern part of Africa. So this area is, is mainly mountainous and these are general low lying areas. So Rwanda is, is, is part of the elevated uh, landscape of the, of, East Africa, and actually generally in all of Africa, it's one of the highest places. Now that's the next graph map here, uh, really shows us the, the yellow are the lowest parts of the country, generally speaking, it's very generalized. And then you have the highest, the highest here. Now this yellow here is borders the, the Rift Valley. But generally, you can say it's it's uh, it's not a very complicated uh, landscape. Now, as I show you, see uh, the the rather dark blue is is the the highest non uh, volcanic rocks. Is the black here is the highest point, which really represents the volcanic mountains, which are in the northern part of the country and associated with rifting. Okay, so now we come now to go systematically to the landscape. Now, Rwanda is here. The, you know, East African Rift Valley has two branches. It has this so-called the Western Arm and has here the Eastern Arm. The instant arm is the one which is associated with high volcanic mountains like Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya. And you see Rwanda is, so our western side, extreme west, is actually bordered by this Rift Valley. And this is DRC, and this is Tanzania, this is Kenya, and this is Uganda. For some of you who are not familiar with East Africa. Now, so the the Rwanda landscape, if uh, uh, it, the, the western side, which has the Rift Valley, still 
is the, the Rift Valley began to evolve about 3 million years, uh, 30 million years ago in the or Oligocene through the Miocene and even up the recent. So that means that in the extreme west of our nation, we have actually the rift and it is still active. And I showed, I brought this, these are very recent volcanic activities in the area. Now I just uh, bring another volcanic mountain in the rift valley, which is, it's, it's, it's in, the, in DRS in Congo, but very close to Rwanda. So that means that the western part of our nation is actually bordered by the Rift Valley, which is a graben, but still has active uh, volcanoes and also the rifting is still active in a way. Now, so just to close into the, to the rift, so um, uh, this, uh, this line here, this line here is indicating the western border of Rwanda. This is the DRC. And so this is Lake Chivu. It is one of those rift lakes. So it's within the rift graben. So this is a low lying area and low lying bounding coast. And then you have the, the rift. Now we could call it in geomorphology rift, the fault scarp. It's, it's not a very fresh scarp because as we said, this is is uh, relatively old and so the the scarps have in a way receded inward and so this one area is the area bounding the rift and where the countryside has actually uh, been uplifted and represents the highest surface in Rwanda so the the western part of our nation is the highest just because it has been affected by the uplift associated with faulting, you know, rifting is mainly we have normal faults and the shoulders of those faults are uplifted. And so the landscape in Rwanda, the Western landscape is the highest area. It's actually very mountainous and uh, it's the highest area in Rwanda, apart from these volcanic mountains you see, which are of course also associated with the rift. Now the exact rift now goes right into Uganda and this was uh, an arm which is a bit extinct but you see it represents the volcanic mountains which form the highest surface uh, in Rwanda. So this is how it looks like, I mean the topographic profile across the rift, you have the highest, the lowest uh, point in Western Rwanda, the bottom of this lake, Chivu, so bounded by this elevated, uh, uplifted landscape. Now, this landscape is in Congo. It's also lifted up. And so as you go in, in the interior of Rwanda, the landscape becomes relatively lower because it has not been seriously affected by this uplift and the rift. So these are different cross sections across the rift, but generally you can see that it has the, the uh, this bounding rather uplifted landscapes, which actually represent the law, the highest surface in Rwanda, apart from the volcanics. This is, if you look at this map, this is the rift and you can see of course, we know the rift is a very clear geologic control on the landscape. And the, uh, these are the areas which have been affected by the uplift and they represent the highest ground in Rwanda apart from these mountains, of, uh, volcanic mountains in the north. And so as you go in the interior, Oh, yes. The landscape becomes lower, and you see where you have. Yeah, you can take. Sorry, take it. Go ahead, please. Okay, so you have where the, where you have normally the the lowest landscape, 
like here and here and here, uh, they are normally associated with the other granitic batteries I showed you. And these ones are the meta sediments. Actually, the meta sediments represent uh, the highest ground because you know, if you have meta sediments and granites and they are exposed for weathering, um, sorry. Please go fast, please go fast. Sorry, yeah, I, I have, uh, I have, uh, so the, these meta sediments and the granites, you know, the granites get weathered and faster than the meta sediments, although they are young and though they introduce in the meta sediments. And so you, you have the landscape generally getting degraded in the areas where you have granite rock. And then while you have these meta sediments, mainly schists, uh, phyllites, quartzites, meta sandstones, you can see they preserve the hilly country. And when you see the orientation of the hills, they actually are oriented in parallel to the structural grain of the Kibaran rocks. And you can almost see that if you look here in the southeast, the folding and the structuring almost uh, the uh, indicate it actually you can almost map the the folding in the country from the the, the pattern of hills. So I have here the lowest the rifting, the roof shoulders also being uplifted and making the highest. Uh, landscape, and then as you go, yes, you have these meta sediments which have relatively, also, I mean, relatively lower landscape than the uplifted shoulders, but also higher than where you have the granites, which have been uh, preferential weathering in a way. Uh, you have the the igneous rocks when they get exposed to the surface. You know the geomorphology; they get weathered faster. And so they form a more depressed landscape. And so, right, you can almost relate the landscape of this country uh, almost with geology, the histology and the structure. And of course, as you know, this represents a relationship where the, the uh, erosion history is not very, very advanced. So we could say that the structures and the lithology of the Rwandan landscape uh, still control the landscape. So that's that's really the the, the map I showed right here. And you can see the, the elevations there, and um, so we can say that the mountains of the western Rwanda and the northern um, they actually are higher because they represent the shoulders of the rift. And then the central regions are characterized, are characterized by relatively low lying hills and la, uh, lowlands that are associated with granitic bathodes and uh, which are preferentially eroded. And then you have the relatively low, uh, relatively low areas extend to the north. I mean, uh, I showed if, 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 uh, uh, I mean here, yeah, if in the northeast here, these are actually mainly areas uh, which are underlain by granite. And you can see this green high ground represented in meta sediments, mainly the ridges preserved by cot sites. And they, so they, they, they you, you can almost map the geology from the landforms, <laughs> or the other way around. Uh, so, so some of the eastern parts are also hilly. I mean, I talked about the cascading uh, lowering of landscape from the west towards the east. But of course, in the east also, you find some high ground because of the preservation of ridges by cot sites mainly. 
On the eastern could one represent a relatively more mature landscape. Uh, up the plain far the uh, far eastern plains I showed you uh, represents a more depressed topography resulting from the preferential weathering of the underlying granites. So in conclusion, the Rwanda landscape is in a broad sense uh, is intimately controlled by the underlying lithology and structures. However, it should be noted that the former, uh, the landscape, of course, is much younger. It's a much younger phenomenon than the, the geology on which it is lying. But still, because weathering, uh, so erosion is not very advanced, it's not at uh, an old age, you still find a lot of geologic and structural control on the whole landform of the country. Thank you very much. Le contexte de culture, c'est la chaîne panafricaine d'Afrique centrale. Au Cameroun, cette chaîne constitue la plus grande partie des affleurements. Elle est subdivisée en trois principaux domaines le domaine sud Cameroun, le domaine centre Cameroun et le domaine nord Cameroun. La ranoche zone d'étude est située à l'est du domaine nord Cameroun, plus précisément dans la région de l'Estrême, le département du Mayotani, arrondissement de Paélé, le canton de Lara. Madame, nature, nous parlez un peu plus fortement, s'il vous plaît. La nature n'est pas ses composantes. Et... Ok, je vous suis, docteur. La nature n'est pas ses composantes. Bon, et... bon les phénomènes en son sein offrent à l'homme un patrimoine qui constitue l'un des fondements de la compréhension de l'histoire géologique et le milieu de l'économie du secteur touristique dans plusieurs pays dans le monde. Au Cameroun, ce secteur, dans la documentation, il est pratiqué sous quatre formes et ses revenus restent assez limités. Pourtant, le territoire camerounais est constitué des sites géologiques et géomorphologiques extrêmement diversifiés qui méritent d'être valorisés à travers le monde, comme dans d'autres pays. De ce fait, la localité de Lara, avec sa diversité géomorphologique, est une Pour les objectifs que nous sommes fixés comme objectif euh, général, c'était euh, de, de mener une étude pétrographique de l'héritage géologique afin de contribuer à l'implémentation du géotourisme dans la localité de Lara. Plus spécifiquement, c'était un inventaire des géomorphosites, réaliser la carte de l'inventaire du patrimoine géologique et mener une étude détaillée de ces géomorphosites. Alors, la méthodologie et le matériel adopté pour atteindre ces objectifs du travail, une méthode pour les phases de terrain et des laboratoires suivant respectivement l'aspect pétrographique des jours touristiques a été adopté. S'il vous plaît, madame, nous, euh, oui? nous euh, n'avons nous que la diapositive sur la problématique. Je ne sais pas si c'est la même chose que vous avez devant vous, parce que nous n'avons que la diapositive. Non. Voilà, là, maintenant, mm. ça marche. Oui. Là, ça marche maintenant. Oui, vous avez changé. Ça a changé aussi à un autre niveau. Je pense que c'est bon comme ça. Allons-y. OK. Sur la tête pétographique, cette méthode comprend les, les grandes lignes. Il était question de faire les échantillonnages, compression de la mince, leur étude et la cartographie des différentes formations géologiques. Sur la tête géotouristique, elle comprend euh, l'inventaire et description, la cartographie des géomorphosites. Ceci a été facilité par euh, l'exploitation des outils de traitement, notamment le logiciel Excel, le logiciel de cartographie tel que Surf, Agis, Adobe Illustrator. Et ces, ré ces résultats sont très intéressants. Alors, comme ça, nous avons, euh, sur la partie pétographique, nous avons les tritons, les dalles, les blocs de roche, les filons. Et le mode d'altération nous pouvons observer sur les parois rocheuses, les surfaces carapacées, le développement des taphonies sur les parois rocheuses. Et là, nous pouvons observer le développement de la végétation sur les tissus des parois rocheuses. 
Les échantillons collectés sur notre site de nous avons pu répertorier trois facettes les granites roses, les granites blancs et les apis. Et les lames mêmes sur le décès rouge là représentent le phénomène de dame. Là, nous pouvons observer euh, deux générations de microbes à texture assez grise. Le phénomène de damomutilation t'envisage le fait qu'au fil du temps, ce granit a subi un métamorphisme. La texture des, des apites, nous voyons, elle présente une texture aptique. Et là, nous avons notre carte de la distribution de nos échantillons. Là, nous pouvons voir les différents points d'échantillonnage sur notre massif dans la localité de Lara. Nous avons proposé une carte géologique. Là, nous avons les granits blancs, les granits roses et les granits blancs. Alors, euh, le patrimoine géotouristique inventorié dans la localité de Lara, nous avons euh, les blocs erratiques. Nous, avons, nous les avons remis. Là, nous avons NBE2 qui est semblable à l'héritage mondial de l'UNESCO, dans un bloc de rouge granitique déposé sur une dalle granitique. Là, nous avons euh, un autre bloc de rouge semblable à la, à la pierre de Bézo en Suisse. Là, nous avons euh, d'autres blocs de rouge avec des formes assez intéressantes. Là, nous avons un euh, bloc de rouge avec des formes à la vie du champion. Là, un euh, bloc de rouge avec des formes d'une cuvette. Et là, c'est un chien couché qui se casse et casse. Là, nous avons d'autres blocs de roche qui forment de cloches. Et là, euh, un bloc de roche avec la ligne du facteur tendu. L'ensemble des blocs est un héritage biologique qui favorise l'activité du géotourisme dans de nombreux pays dans le monde entier. Nous avons également les dalles. Les dalles également favorisent. Les dalles également, autant pour moi, constituent un patrimoine géologique comme celle dans les dalles de l'Ensuite. Sur ces dalles, nous pouvons observer les, les, le développement des cultures, des mammites, des géants. La situation est autre ici de la localité de Lara. Nous avons repéré deux catégories de visiteurs, les locaux et les étrangers. Les travailleurs, les locaux sont constitués des travailleurs, des étudiants et des élèves. Les étrangers sont les originaires du Tchad et de la France. Et là, nous avons un autre histogramme. Dans cet histogramme, nous pouvons constater que les étudiants et les élèves sont, les, sont ceux qui visitent le plus euh, la localité. Là, nous avons notre carte les jours montrent le cycle potentiel de la localité de Lara. Là, ce sont les dalles, les blocs de rouge. Et là, nous avons les différentes voies d'accès à ces jours montrent En conclusion, les entités jours montrent de la localité de Lara constituent un héritage géologique exploitable pour les jours qui visent. Cet héritage en fait est constitué de jours montés tels que les blocs avec des formes et des dimensions impressionnantes, les dalles aux superficies impressionnantes. Euh, la, la, la communauté locale est plus attirée par des jours montés. Mais le fait que la localité de Lara regorge des jours montés potentiels énormes, la pratique du jour tourisme reste mal connue. L'inventaire de tel jour mon poste encore il aurait du grand public et des décideurs bien mettre en évidence les données géologiques qui sont essentielles pour l'implémentation du jeu tourisme dans la localité de l'arbre. Alors l'intérêt de ce travail, c'est les données sur le massif granit de la localité de l'arbre complètent les informations sur la géologie régionale et renforcent davantage la valorisation des jours mon poste. Sur le plan géotouristique, ces résultats contribuent à la valorisation du patrimoine géologique et booster l'économie locale de l'art. Je vous remercie pour votre marge attention.
So thank you, Dia Gisela, for this opportunity to present these uh, few slides on the soil loss measurement models applied in Rwanda. And uh, after this, we shall come up with the aerosol GIS based model, which was applied on a, a, a small catchment, a catchment which, which is called the Satinsky in the Western province of Rwanda. Uh, First, we start with a, a short, a brief introduction. Then we talk briefly about the soil erosion measurement models applied in Rwanda. And then we, we give a, an example, a case study of the research which was conducted on the certain ski catchments. Then, uh, uh, with respect to the, this uh, case study, we shall just uh, present briefly material and methods, and also we shall talk about the results and the discussion, and then we shall conclude. So, briefly, I would like to talk about the importance of assessing soil loss in Rwanda. Rwanda is a hilly country where in some regions we can have the very steep slope as presented by my colleagues, mostly in the western part of the country and the northern part of the country. These are the part of the country which is very hilly and where uh, much rates of soil loss are recorded. So these hills are largely cultivated and the population is very dense in that particular area. And also these uh, lead to some kind of uh, natural or anthropogenic hazards which are connected to soil erosion from, of course, both natural hill, hilly landscape and the intensive activity, which make the understanding of the high rate of soil erosion in our country. Okay, what we can say after a brief review we come up with the, the, the conclusion that uh, not many uh, models to assess soil loss were applied in Rwanda, but we can say that it is a likely a, a kind of one model which was uh, upgraded constantly, as we know. Uh, First studies to assess soil loss started with the universal soil loss equation, which was applied at the parcel scale. But later on, some researchers used universal soil loss equation, GIS based model applied at catchment scale. And uh, this uh, model was applied with some variations like a uh, universal soil loss equation, which was uh, combined with uh, the soil loss and the crop yield parameters. So why this? This is, a, it is because of uh, the nature of geomorphology in our country is just uh, shifting. I can say is much considering the application aspects rather than to be more traditional. So they wanted just to connect the geomorphology, mainly the soil erosion with the, um, the, the land use. And definitely uh, this aerosol model, as we know, it is the universal soil loss equation which was upgraded 
by considering some topographic uh, parameters in the GIS, GIS environment. So now this model is being applied and this is what we have used on our uh, catchment of a study. So as we are talking about uh, this uh, revised the universal solar equation based GIS based model as it was applied on our study area. So the study area, which is the certain city catchment is located in the Ngororero district in the Western province of Rwanda. And the spatial location of the study area is bounded by Sorry, a minute. It's bounded by one degree and 44 minutes and one degree and uh, one degree and uh, a minute. Yeah, as I have said, I've been saying. So, um, and it, I am. I was saying. Sorry, the screen was somehow complicating here. I was saying that uh, the this area, certain sea catchment, is located in Gorel District in the Western Province, with a special um, location which is close to the equator and uh, high altitude ranging, presenting high altitude ranging between 1,400 and 2,800 meters. And the area is deeply dissected by certain river and its tributaries. And in this region, as it is located at the, the Eastern shoulder of the Rift Valley, Western Rift Valley, so the altitude, the high amount of precipitation is somehow correlated to the elevation of this area. So maybe as we can see it on this, uh, on this map, we can see that uh, this uh, uh, catchment is located in this uh, Western province, specifically in the in Gorilla district. Now, the methods used uh, for this research involved the processing of input factors in GIS environment, which enabled to obtain the five factors of, uh, of course, of the Russell model. Huh? And also the method we used, we focused on land use and land cover data, which are uh, enabled to, uh, to have, uh, which uh, enabled to have this, uh, uh, we can say C factor and the daily recorded ra rainfall, which enabled to find the R factor and also we have a process at the DM, which has a 10 meter resolution to have to generate uh, yeah, LS factor and P factor. And of course, the K factor were obtained from the soil data. Yeah. Now, this is uh, somehow I can say the Russell GIS a workflow that we used or we followed to come up with the final product of our research. So as a result, uh, we have uh, produced the five factors which are required to, to run the model, the Russell model. And here down, this is the estimated soil 
loss as the results or as the, the product of the five factors. Now this, uh, on these uh, two maps, here the first one, which is uh, red colored, it shows the soil loss per slope, but the other one, um, it shows the soil loss severity classes. Uh, sorry, minutes. Okay. <clears throat> Now, the annual soil loss in our, we consider the slope aspect. So we can have these uh, slope ranges, which uh, include mostly, or which were classified into four classes. And here we have, um, the area in hectare, of course, and their percentages. And here we have uh, the, the mean value of uh, mean value of uh, soil loss. Oh, sorry, mean value of uh, soil loss. Oh. Okay. Mean value of here it is the the table which shows the estimated soil loss uh, per uh, severity classes. Some researchers have tried to classify the soil loss uh, according to how the slope can be correlated with the severity of the soil is the erosion of the soil. And based on that uh, approach, we have classified our classes of uh, severity of soil loss into these respective classes. And this classification, it is according to researchers, very important so that we can know how to allocate appropriate mitigation measures or remedies. So in brief, yeah, we can um, conclude that Rwanda is one of countries with an increasing population. Yeah, within uh, just less than 30 years, the population of Rwanda has doubled. And also there is a high demand of land for agriculture production and construction. And also we have also the need of, of yeah, the land which is being used by miners also, it is uh, something which is having impact on the land. So on all sides, the land is scarce that is why we needed to come up with the appropriate studies and recommendations so that the land can be used rationally for the benefit of our population. They are greater than 15 degrees. And this uh, steep slope, the, it characterizes the majority of the land or the area of study. The catchment also accounts for high population density. And also we can see that the average value of a soil loss rate, soil loss rate of 13 is far beyond the recommended value, the, toler the tolerable value for maximizing the 
crop production because this value is a was a, which is recommended is fixed at 10 ton per hectare per year. If it is more than that, so we need to be serious and to come up with the appropriate technique to protect or to mitigate soil loss. Now, given that uh, extensive part of Statinsi catchment presents a steeper slope and thus prone to soil high loss rates, knowledge of processes involved in soil erosion are very important because they will just guide in a, a decision taking about the preserving of, of soil and also mitigation of uh, mitigation measures of uh, the soil loss. Now I think this was a brief presentation of uh, of uh, uh, this uh, study. If you have uh, some questions, you are welcome. So I tried it to be much brief. Thank you so much, dear Shisla. I am here today to show uh, coral reef biogeomorphology of Ras Muhammad, South Sina, Egypt, Dr. Muhammad Abdelghani. Uh, introduction location Ras Muhammad National Park located at South type of Sina, Venezuela, as extends into the Gulf of Aqaba and the Tehran, Sanafir, is classified to two parts, the marine part, part of Gulf of Suez and part of the Gulf of Aqaba, which represented 17 percentage and the part represented 13. Objective, the objective of this is the paper to define type of coral reef Biogeomorphological map and geomorphological features in the study dependent remote sensing analysis and extensive field surveying, profiling, and mapping. Results and discussion small activities with large effect. Uh, this show the remind of expand next to vertical line and the activity of the different weather processing. Caves is coral reef platform. Result from rain, water, lake, and the night humidity that from fail due to some and wind. A coral reef platform with the of Marcel Guzlan, Hamza Mitter High, curves to like to crabs bio erosion that show the dimension of the hole of crabs and the crab out of hole. Bio erosion the Mangrove Canal. Sea graces are dynamic. Choose a figure of land and the mangrove plant and sand range. The reef legon coral reef. Rocky shore is shown the biological curves and alga from the surface. This features is bio geomorphology. Can you? Use the remote sensing is B kills filter of coastal Ras Muhammad National Park MG classification by spectral angular method in the program LV 5.6 and the percentage in the program ArcGIS GIS 10.1. Uh, can you rank as a 3D study area low pollution and the mid pollution and the high pollution? Can you steps in the using Sentinel Coral by program of SNAP uh, identify coral reef as it is developed or order to be used in checking photo specialist of that of coral reef? The topographic of sea bottom, the valid the valid value appear after making a mask of the land and blue, raise percentage to the future. The latest that in the blue right. Can you uh, profile, long profile, uh, the show, a vertical slice of the polluted area and the vertical slice 
finally uh, distribution of coral reef area in Ras Muhammad uh, legend uh, coral reef uh, uh, bl blue and cutting coral reef barrier reef show water low to middle depths can you can you use the highest uh, image and slide and uh, radar image can you yeah okay sorry i am a problem in link Never mind. Net network please go ahead please go ahead uh, this map distribution of coral reef area ras muhammad area uh, can you uh, coral reef detect by uh, spectral uh, uh, resolution and uh, um, cutting coral reef or barrier reef show rotor low to median depths or, or uh, median depths or deeps can you uh, 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 extract hair by uh, sentinel 2 uh, special resolution uh, 10 meters and uh, uh, use uh, lidar image to detect uh, the type of coral in, uh, in Ras Muhammad National Park. Uh, finally, uh, I am so happy to uh, to hear, and uh, I am so sorry to uh, to to list. Thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure. Uh, any question? Can you? Okay, I'm presenting on soil moisture dynamics, the research progress and catchment scale case study analysis from southwest Nigeria. Soil moisture is the water held within soil pores or water contained in the unsaturated soils in Ovado zone and it is made up of the surface soil moisture and the root zone soil moisture. Soil moisture is a connection between soil, climate and vegetation and it is also important in hydrological, biological, and geomorphological studies. Soil moisture is greatly influenced by precipitation, temperature, boundary layer stability, and soil characteristics. And of all these atmospheric influences, soil moisture is you known. The precipitation is the most important influence on soil moisture content. And soil moisture in return affects and influences precipitation values. So the research problem, in measuring soil moisture, we have the direct methods and the indirect methods. And the direct methods are the graphometric method, which is Hello. open drying, whereby the soil is measured at, whereby the soil is put in the oven no. and at 105 degrees Celsius and weighed on the scale. And from there we can get the moisture content of the soil. I also have the use of sensors, which measures data temporally. However, the graphometric method is as it is advantage that it is it requires extensive labor and continuous in situ measurements or in situ measurements. While for the sensor, the disadvantage is that it could be very expensive. And in a place like Nigeria, where it's a place like Nigeria, because of course it could be difficult to afford. So most researchers in this part of the world have relied on laboratory techniques to measure soil moisture which is not okay. The indirect method consists of remote sensing and models. And remote sensing has been of great advantage to the sub saharan Africa because it is good for poorly gauge catchment and it covers a large area of land. But remote sensing data has only information for the top soil and cannot penetrate in, 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 in depth. And remote sensing data can be affected by cloud cover and vegetation cover but sensors cannot be affected by that. So in soil moisture analysis, it is actually advisable to use both um, direct method and indirect method for good analysis. And this has been a challenge in sub-Saharan Africa. Also, most hydrological models that have been used to estimate soil moisture studies in the African continent, they've been developed from non-African soils. And this is like substituting the summer and winter of the temperate region to wet and dry uh, season. This, uh, I did, uh, I did you. I did sir? you. Yes, Please, sir. Uh, your, your, your slides are not moving. Yes, sir. So I'm on the aim and objectives now. 
So the aim of the study is to initiate a long-term soil monitor monitoring experimental campaign in Nigeria. And the objectives are to determine the soil moisture content under selected land uses, also to examine the relationship between soil moisture and rainfall and to assess the influence of soil moisture or soil characteristics on soil moisture. Another objective is to compare the result from soil moisture rainfall relationship from ground-based data sources with that of the field. As I mentioned earlier that it's better to use both direct and indirect methods. So the materials and methods used for this study, five different land uses were considered in the teaching and research research from over Femawolo University. The first was the arable farmland, followed by the perennial farmland, which consists of both the cocoa and the oil palm, as well as the riparian wetland and built up area. Then on each of the land uses, a 25 meter by 25 meter plot was marked for monitoring for the period of one hydrological year. And we intend to monitor continuously so we can be able to predict the future from the results. And soil samples were obtained from five meter by five meter interval on each plot for determining the physical properties of the soil. And the properties determined were the bulk density, particle size distribution, and porosity. The soil moisture was measured with a soil moisture kit at 1.25 meter by 1.25 meter interval. And all locations were measured with the GPS at less than five meter accuracy. And this is the soil moisture kit that was used for the research. So the average monthly rainfall in the study area was derived from satellite data and over the period of 30 years, 1992 to 2021. And this graph shows the percentage contribution of each month to the total annual rainfall. January has a percentage of 1.10 and February of, of 1.40. And we have the peak in September, 16.80%. So the so physical characteristics, this shows the bulk density, porosity, and the particle size distribution. For the particle size distribution from the laboratory studies, we realized that the soil textural class is sandy and the bulk density, as bulk density increases, porosity reduces. So the highest bulk density was found in the riparian vegetation. And it also, that you see riparian vegetation as the lowest result for bulk density, followed by the oil palm. And then the cocoa area has a high bulk density with low porosity values. So the general obs the observations and results so far for the arable land in the month of January, the mean was 1.35%. And the first rain for the year occurred on the 16th of February. So by the time data was taken again on the 17th of February, the result shows that the mean had increased to 5.76% in for the arable land. That's how you can see you, a change in the color. Sir? I did that you please. Yes. Uh, your, the, the slides stop moving again. Okay, can you see my slide now, sir? Yes, we are seeing your slide. Yes. Okay, sir. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Yes, go ahead. Okay, please. so for the built up area, the mean increased from 0.13% to 5.5% after the first train for the year in the month of February and the variability dropped from 150 to 45.8%. And the riparian vegetation, the mean increased by from 13.9% to 16.8% volume. So the implications and consideration, the rainfall in February from the rainfall data of 30 years shows that the month of February contributes 1.4% of total annual rainfall, but it has resulted in change in the average soil moisture except for the riparian vegetation and early in the month of february the riparian vegetation was affected by wildfire and we believe that there will be more evidence to to indicate the implication of these wildfire incidents over time and for the oil palm it showed lesser change than other plots lesser variation compared to other plots in the soil moisture content and so far we just have data for two months because our instruments arrived very late. So there is no sufficient data to quantitative link 
rainfall and so moisture. But we believe that at the end of the hydrological year, we will be able to achieve our results by showing a conceptualized relationship between soil moisture and rainfall. By, by the time we get our results from both wet and dry season for soil, from the soil moisture sensor, and we use this Landsat data and satellite data, then we intend to build a model using the IDROS one dimensional software and paleontological statistics to get the variation over the different land uses. So, the challenges of this study. <coughs> Because of theft and uh, the issue of theft and attacks on the field, we could not leave our instruments on the farm. And because of the high cost of the instruments, we could only afford one soil moisture kit for the five land uses. And for the rainfall weather station, we had to rely on manual rain gauge and satellite based rainfall data because we could not afford automated rain gauge. So we acknowledge the support of the of the German team in the acquisition of the soil moisture kit, the director of the teaching and research firm of the OU of Upper Farm Law University campus and the head of the Department of Geography for the support. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Gislana, for doing this, uh, organizing this excellent webinar that we had the, this morning. Um, and thank you to all the presenters who managed to get uh, present uh, this morning. And uh, the, I was really impressed by the excellent quality of the presentations and the work. And I hope that we have an equally successful event uh, next year as well. And I'd encourage you to have a look on the IAG website uh, and see what else is going on this week. There's more webinars in other parts of the world and uh, I'm sure equally interesting topics and uh, the African region this year was the first region in the in the webinars and I'm very proud that this this was one of the first uh, webinars so thank you very much and uh, I wish you all a, a very pleasant International Geomorphology Week and thank you for for attending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Suzanne for this more work. Thank you for recalling that uh, the the geomorphology week is uh, will be is animated with uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, webinars uh, from Europe, America, Asia, and I would like to invite uh, all the presenter and other or just listener to uh, join those events to enjoy the geomorphology across the world. I would like to give the floor to the president of the International Association of Geomorphologists, who is Professor Mauro, so that the same thing about what we live today. <coughs> thank you, Gislan. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, especially thanks uh, for organizing this uh, webinar, the first of the series of this third edition of the International Geomorphology Week. So you were the first uh, to open uh, the week and at the moment uh, there is another uh, webinar ongoing. It is the one dedicated to Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so I invite also those who are here with us at the moment uh, to, to move to the other one and follow it. And in the next days, as you said, uh, the program is very intense. Uh, it is important to, to thank also those who are behind the scenes uh, like our uh, Vice President Susan Conway, uh, who have dealt with all uh, the chairs of the nine webinars to arrange uh, this uh, wonderful program. And uh, there are also very interesting side uh, events, and you, you can find all the information on the IEG web uh, site. The, the week uh, will continue, actually, uh, with an appendix uh, that will occur next week and, and talking about uh, the event. Uh, thanks, Susan, for sharing the link. Um, I'm talking about uh, the, the uh, workshop for women in geomorphology, which will be held on uh, the uh, 8th of March, 8 March. Uh, yeah. and it is organized by the Hellenic Group for Geomorphology and the Environment, so the Greek National Scientific Member of the IG. This workshop is at the second edition. Last year it was very successful and I guess it will be 
I'm sure it will be very successful this year too. So I wish you are also thinking about joining joining this this event. And then uh, the major event in 2022 will be the Coimbra Conference. Actually, uh, it is the International Conference on Geomorphology that is held every four years. It will take place between 12 and 16 uh, September uh, 2022 in Coimbra, Portugal. It will be preceded and followed by uh, an interesting program of field trips and intensive courses. The deadline for abstract submission is 14th March, and you can find all the information on the conference website, but also on the IEG website. So please uh, have a look of it. We truly hope that this will be held uh, in person uh, since the, the pandemic is actually, actually decreasing its intensity. So we truly hope to meet all together after such a long time in Portugal uh, this summer. Um, so thanks very much uh, also for giving me the opportunity to say hello to all the participants in this workshop and uh, have a, a good International Geomorphology Week all together.